Welcome, welcome to the Avenue Church. We are incredibly glad that you guys are here. If you can't tell, there's something happening this morning. There's something, uh, like you might say, in the air. That is the presence of God's Spirit. It is a pre- if you don't know that presence, that's okay. Hang around. It becomes very contagious. Okay, I just want to warn you. It becomes very contagious. And so uh, hopefully you guys feel welcome here. Uh, my name is Casey. I get to serve as one of your pastors. Thank you, Matt. And um, we're excited. We are super excited about today. Today is Connect Day. So we're going to be um, getting a chance to interact with some of the people who are leading the ministries that we have coming up here in this first quarter of our church. And so uh, we'll, uh, we'll be inviting you guys forward. They'll be up here at the end end of service for you guys to get some information, put a face to a name. It's going to be an awesome uh, Connect Day. And and so before we kind of like launch into 2019, I know you're probably there. I know your Christmas decorations are probably down. Um, You've probably transitioned into the next season, whatever that is. You've got the kids' lunches made already because, you know, tomorrow is school. That's what's up. Okay, kids are going back. And um, so, so you're probably, like, like myself, I'm ready to run into 2019. This Sunday and next Sunday are going to be like um, two vision Sundays for us. We're going to be talking about the vision that God has given us for this particular church, both this Sunday, we're going to look theologically at the foundation of it, and then next Sunday we're going to talk about the culture that supports that vision. So super excited. I want to hop right into that. But before I do, we got to talk a little bit about 2018. I mean, it was pretty epic, right? It was awesome. It was awesome. Again, if you're like me, you're ready to hop in and keep going, but it would be a mistake to not stop and be like, Lord, thank you for your goodness in 2018 because it was an awesome year. For us at the Avenue, we said it was going to be a new season. We said this is going to be a new season. We talked about new wine and new wineskins and that there was going to be a lot of um, a newness to us here at this particular church. And so I just wanted to, I made a list of some things uh, that, that kind of came to life, if you will, in, uh, in 2018, and, and we, we walked through some transition, things like that, and, and in the midst of all that, God brought some new things to life that I wanted to just highlight, share, we can thank him for it, and then uh, uh, celebrate that as well. And so some of the new things that were brought to life, and, and I did this based on the strategic framework that we have for our church, there are a couple um, outcomes that we aim this church toward, uh, and, and, and so these are some of the things that came to life within those outcomes. The first one is disciples. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome when you get to say that you, you had the privilege and honor of baptizing 37 individuals. Um, yeah, so that's, that's amazing. That's amazing opportunity to be able to baptize 37 individuals. And so we say thank you, Jesus, first and foremost um, for that. And we know that he uses his community to do that. Nobody gets baptized in isolation. Most of your stories are all connected to somebody else who lovingly brought you into the presence of, of Jesus. And so um, that, that's great testimony to what the Lord is doing. We were able to add a ton of new members. We got to see um, things like onboarding come to life, which is our, our new membership journey. Um, DNAs, different DNAs. Uh, and, and just it was, it was a really cool year as far as discipleship goes. And in disciples and discipleship, what that means is somebody who walks in the ways of Jesus and, and teaches others um, to do the same. And so really excited about some new life that, that uh, happened there. And then as far as leaders go, um, new life that God brought into us. This was our first year of having residents. We had a few residents that we were able to pour into and um, uh, mentor. Uh, we, we saw new youth group leaders come to life, which was awesome because we also saw a new youth group come to life, uh, which is just an amazing gift uh, from the Lord uh, for us. And so as we think about that, we also saw new FPNO uh, leaders and, and uh, volunteers and, uh, and we are in the midst of seeing a new church plant come to life with Michael James. And, uh, and so as far as, as far as leaders go, that's been awesome. As far as family goes, uh, we've seen some new life with AC, in, AC Kids engagement. Uh, that's just been amazing with volunteers and service and leadership, things like that. I mentioned this before, but uh, we, we can't skip over it too quickly. Like God is doing something really beautiful, not only with our AC Kids, but with our AC Youth Group. 
And um, that has come to life in a really significant and special way. And we're just, we're incredibly grateful for the new life that God has brought there. We've also seen um, new life uh, within our quarterly system. We, we switched over the way we kind of did our community, our family life into a quarterly system to try to open the doors for some more engagement. And so we're thankful for the Lord there. Collaboration is another outcome that, that we've been shooting for and, and looking towards uh, in 2018. And we saw God bring new life with us as it pertains to a new space. Our offices are now at Trinity Del Rey. Uh, we've seen new life uh, with our relationship uh, to Trinity and just being able to partner and bring this idea of Church United into a tangible expression. Uh, and so that, that's just been incredibly uh, exciting uh, for my heart and hopefully uh, for yours as well. And then we've also had, a, had new engagement with the Church United movement. Church United is a movement. It's, it's, there's no, you don't like join necessarily. You just basically say, hey, I believe that Jesus was really serious about John 17 when he prayed that his church would become one. And that as the church becomes one, the world will know that the Father sent the Son. And so we've just seen our church and churches around in this local area gathered together more and more and more, not just to hang out, to be like, you know, oh, this is cool to have a, a church buddy, but no, to be unified for mission, to see the lost get saved in the name of Jesus uh, be raised. And so we've just seen greater engagement uh, there. And then the final one is faithful presence. We've seen this, this thing that kind of started as, I don't know, probably one of our bad ideas come to life called Love Del Rey. And uh, it is, it's taken off. It really has. It's really kind of a movement here in the city that's gone far beyond one church. And, uh, and so as far as a faithful presence goes, we, we're thankful to God that he's brought to life uh, Love Del Rey, which is an opportunity for churches and nonprofits and, and anyone really to get involved in something larger than themselves. And, and, uh, but it's fueled by the power and presence of God's spirit. And, uh, and so that's been awesome. And, and just even uh, as recently as our, our Christmas Eve Unplugged, that was a new thing that God brought to life uh, last year uh, where we went sort of, we took, took our Christmas Eve service and we did it in an unplugged fashion, sort of organically uh, out by the Pure Greens, um, Pure Strands, Pure Life uh, little courtyard there. So anyways, I just wanted to stop and say thank you, Lord, for all those wonderful things and just celebrate the fact that God was on the move really beautifully in 2018. So I'm just going to give the Lord thanks in, in prayer, and, uh, and then we'll hop into 2019. Father, thank you for how you call us to stop and remember you. Lord, this isn't about what this church accomplished. This is about the fact that you have a plan to show your glory to all of creation through the church. Father, you, you tell us in your word that it's, it's through the church that like your manifold wisdom is being made known. Your glory is being made known through us, the, the church. And so we just thank you that you are a God who's good to his word and who brings good things to life. Father, as we look uh, back, our hearts are grateful. And we use that gratitude not only to draw closer to you, but to draw uh, strength and confidence for the days ahead. We thank you, Father. We pray you fill us with your spirit even now in Christ's name. Amen. So as we start looking at 2019, um, we, we, we're, we're going to be having this, uh, having this theme that's with us, that, that guides us and that leads us. And uh, it, it's this idea of expecting greater things, expecting um, greater things things. And so it's actually a vision that's going to be a two-year vision for us at the church, and we're going to be exploring kind of, we'll, we'll, like, what's the biblical foundation for that? And is it even fair to have this type of vision? And, and is there biblical ground to stand on? We're calling it Vision 2020 because we're looking at these things becoming a reality within the next two years. Vision 2020, expect greater things. And so if you have your Bibles today, we're going to look at um, some of the biblical foundation of this vision. It's going to be in John chapter 14. And we want to we wanna dive right in because we believe, as um, one of the Blackaby brothers writes, like, you don't need to be super creative. You just need to figure out what God is doing and join him. That's what we want to do. We're not trying to, like, create some new, unique vision. We're just trying to figure out, God, what are you doing and how can we best join you? And I believe that um, greater things is what God is doing right, right now. And, and, and it's our joy and responsibility um, to be able to join him. So the context for John 14, we're going to do a deep dive in, uh, on one verse actually today, John 14, and then we'll, we'll, we'll set some context for it with other verses. 
Jesus is coming to the close of his ministry and he's about to leave. And um, if you have kids, there's probably different ways that you left them in different stages of their development. So here's what I mean. When you, know, when you had a baby, if it was your first baby, you just never left them, right? It's like they're always with you, attached to the hip, okay? So let's pretend like you're on baby two or three or four, okay? So when you get to that baby, there's going to be different ways that you leave that child. So some, sometimes you're going to leave that child like, oh, hey, mommy and daddy are leaving. We love you. Come here, give us a kiss. It's going to be super awesome. And you, you confirm that you're leaving and, and we love you and we, we're going to be back. Others of you might be in a different season where, where you and your wife coordinate with the person who's coming over to watch your kid. Yo, we're going to slip out the back. And, and like nobody is going to know that we left, okay? Tom and Jerry is on. We're over here, and we're gone. By the time they notice us, it'll be close. Feed them something, put them to bed. So, so it kind of depends on the, the stage of your kid, how you actually leave. So Jesus is about to leave his kids, right? In John 14, he's been with these disciples three years. They've, they've fallen in love with him. They don't fully understand him. He's kind of like, uh, like this odd contagious figure that they want more of, but they don't fully grasp. And, and they get to sort of the end of his ministry, and he's preparing to leave them. And Jesus doesn't just bounce. He doesn't just jet the scene and leave and 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 hope that they figure it out on their own. Nor does he say, hey, listen, I know, I know it's going to be super, super sad that, uh, that when I go away, I'm going to leave, and you're going to, you're going to just basically kind of wait for me to come back, and it's going to be really rough, but, but I'm going to come back one day and make everything right. That's true, but that's not how he leaves them. This is how he leaves him. He's like, listen, I'm going to go. It's going to be rough. There's going to be some rough stuff out there. But you're, you're incredibly safe. Like, I've got you. No matter what happens to you, I've got you. And as a matter of fact, not only am I going to go, and not only are you loved, and not only am I letting you know this very clearly, but as a matter of fact, you're going to be better off when I go. It's actually going to be better for you and better for the world around you that I go. As a matter of fact, this is going to blow your mind. And then, and then Jesus like leaves the scene shortly after. You're going to do greater things than I did. And then he, if you know the narrative, it goes pretty quickly after that into it. Last Supper, trial, death, resurrection. But he leaves them in this like really curious way. You're okay. You're good. I've got you. It's going to be rough, but I've got you. And here, here's, here's what I want you to think about. It's way better for me to go than for me to stay. And you're actually going to do greater things than I did. I mean, those are the words of Jesus. Those are the words that he leaves his kids with. And they have been with us ever since. So now either they're true or they're not. Either Jesus has been resurrected from the dead and everything he says is true, or he's still dead somewhere and those words are just another false promise from like a a martyr type guy. I mean, because nobody can say those kind of words and there not be serious implications. And so what we're gonna do, we're just gonna kind of look at at those words and and examine what, what did he really mean by that? And then what does that mean for us as a church here in 2019 and 2000? 20. And so um, let's, let's turn to John 14, and we're going to be in, in uh, verse 12. And like I said, the, the, he's been having dialogue with them back and forth about his leaving and that they're going to be okay. And then he, then he just says it. Watch this, this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. You want to talk about like a mic drop. That's amazing. Okay, most of the time I end sermons like, hey, love you guys, see you next week. Jesus is like, love you guys, I'll be back. And by the way, you're going to blow it up while I'm gone. It's going to be amazing. World revolution on you. See ya. And then, and then he goes. And he leaves it in the hands of like Peter, John, James. I mean, if you know these guys, you start to think, well, I got a shot at playing too, maybe. You know, like I, maybe, maybe I'm part of this revolution as well. Truly, truly. Like, Jesus is, so 
you know, my, my mind is kind of stuck in movies that play and repeat in my house, so I'm, excuse the Shrek um, analogy, but, but th this is Donkey coming in and seeing the princess saying, I am playing no games. Like, this is, this is I'm, not, I'm not pretending here. Jesus is like, listen, listen to me. I'm telling you the truth. As much as I'm going to get up from the dead, this is true. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever is, I love these vast words that get to include people like me. You don't know me. Some of you do. You don't know how self-consuming I am. You don't know who I was before Jesus. Not many of you do. Mom and dad are here, okay? They do. You, you don't know the King Casey Havoc that I was on course to, to wreak. And you don't know my life before Jesus. And you don't even know all the darkness and, and some of the ways that the gospel still have, hasn't penetrated my heart today. But I just love it when Jesus, when he says things like this, whoever, even me, man, even me who's still confused and doubtful and prone to other shiny things besides Jesus, even me, I get to play like this. Whoever believes in me, what, what are they going to do? They're going to do the works that I do. Wait, wait, gets better. And greater works than these he will do. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to take a, a look, man. W let's break that down, and then let's do an even deeper dive on the works that Jesus was doing, and then and this idea of greater works. Okay? Cool. Um, so, so I say to you, whoever believes. So as we kind of like work through this, believes in me. We're just going to kind of, you know, if you have a Bible, um, hopefully you do. I know we've got free Bibles out there. If you've got a phone Bible, that's cool too. You need to engage it and mark it up. Clean Bibles, you don't win a prize for that, okay? Dirty, tattered, torn up Bibles, those are the ones that mean something. Okay, those are the ones that I'm going to look for. That's the one I'm going to give my kids. It's actually that, I'm, not, I'm, not even, I'm playing no games. This, this one right here, it's all nasty. And one, one of the things that I want to do, I lose stuff all the time. But I'm not, I'm not losing this because it's all written up. It's all, I got like all sorts of circles. That, and, and I want my kids to have this when I'm gone because I want the Spirit to speak to them how he spoke to me and even greater, okay? And so um, you need to have a, a word. You need to have the word and you need to mark it up and get in it. And then you need to hold on to it and give it to somebody you love. All right. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, believes in me. So what does that mean to believe in Jesus? That's not just mental assent, okay? That's not just saying, well, I believe he was a historical figure, or I believe, you know, it's not even saying I believe he died for my sins. That's part of it. But, but mentally assenting to what Jesus did, I mean, even the demons can give historical mental assent to some of the things that Jesus did. And so believing in Jesus, I was kind of like thinking through, how, how do we kind of break this down. We break it down for you guys every week, but, but how do we break this down in, in a sort of a meaningful way? To believe in Jesus means that you are embracing both his, his work for you specifically and his ways. His work and his ways. Um, it might be like if you believed in a particular politician, if you believe in a particular politician to, like, to the degree that it really captured your life, which is the way that Jesus always talks. He doesn't talk surface. He, Jesus is never into the shallow end of the pool. He loves the deep end, okay? So when he says something, he's talking about the deep end. And so if, if you were to take the politician example, if you believed in a particular politician, what that means is that you would believe in the work of that politician, the vision of that politician, and the ways of that politician so much so that you would not only vote for that politician, align yourself with that politician, but then you would follow and campaign for that politician. You would actually live the way that politician lived because you believed in it so much. The, some of the words that I was kind of working through is uh, 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 arrest and results. That there would be a rest that you have in the work of Jesus, that you'd be able to rest in it, and, and you, wouldn't have to, um, you wouldn't have to look anywhere else. So Jesus is like, come to me and I'll give you life. 
If you believe in Jesus, that means you rest in that. You've quit looking for your life in other relationships or your job or your substances or whatever. I mean, you're resting in Jesus as your life. If, if you believe in Jesus, um, that, that he, he died for your sins, was punished in your place and, and overcame your sin and death, and you can be forgiven by that, if you're resting in that, then that means you've quit trying to prove yourself through like religious activities or um, you've quit trying to earn it by being good. You've given up the whole good theology. You realize there was only one good. His name is Jesus, and I can rest in his work, not mine. Um, you're resting in, in your relationship with God through the forgiveness of Jesus and, and not any other kind of um, relationships that you think might bring you significance, even if they're really good relationships like your family or your wife or your job, whatever. Like, like you've come to a place of, I am giving up on me and all these things around me, and Jesus, I'm resting in your work in what you say that you accomplished for me on the cross, that you died in my place, rose again, and, and that that is fully enough for me to be made right with God. I'm resting in that. I'm not looking for anything to add to that. It also means that there's results that follow that. If you believe in Jesus, there's results that go along with your resting. So it doesn't mean, resting doesn't mean that I don't do anything. It means that because I believe so deeply and I've embraced what Jesus promises specifically through his death and resurrection, I am now willing to start following his ways. I'm now willing to call him my master. If he's good enough to be my savior, he's certainly good enough to be my master. And the result of my life is that I start living differently. I start having a different appetite. I start wanting more the things of God. I actually start wanting more the person of God. And so my life starts to gradually, uh, in a process, look differently. So what it means to believe in Jesus is that I would rest in his finished work on my behalf. I would rest in his promises. And that I would have some results in my life that start to look more and more like Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying here in this first part of the verse, is that those of you who believe in me, you're going to rest in me, and you're going to have results that start to look like me more and more and more. It says this, they're going to do the works that I do. So we have to ask ourselves the question, which we're going to do in just a second here, what are the works that Jesus was doing? Well, Jesus had pretty much a threefold ministry of preaching, teaching, and healing. That's, if you look at the life of Jesus and all the Gospels, he's doing usually one of those things. He's also doing a lot of eating, which I love, and um, so you, if you want to add that there as well, but, but it was in the context, all, everything that he did was in the context of, of him bringing the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom of God had broken into humanity and was now available to people like me and to people like you who would be willing to believe in Jesus, rest, and follow him. Okay, so uh, what about greater works? Well, the idea here of greater works could also be translated greater things. Greater things. And what that means is that we're not going to do uh, more significant work than Jesus. It's not like we're necessarily going to look at Jesus' ministry and say, okay, well, we're going to do things that matter more. What it means is that we are going to take the essential work of Jesus and we are going to see it increase in magnitude. It's going to multiply through us far greater than it did within the three years of Jesus' ministry. So, so you're not going to do something better. You're just going to do something more. It's going it's it's to have greater magnitude to it. And then finally here, it's a because. Because. And, and so this is very specifically, Jesus gives us a reason why this can happen. He says, when I leave, I'm going to go to the Father. So Jesus right now literally is at the right hand of the Father. He has completed his death and resurrection, his, his rescuing part of the mission. There's another part to be completed, which is when he brings renewal to all things. He's going to come back and do that. But because he went to the Father, Jesus promised, and his promises are only as good as his resurrection. So wherever you fall in his resurrection is where you're going to fall in his promises. 
He promises that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to us, and the Holy Spirit is going to fill us and enable us to do these greater works, these works that he's doing, and then even, even greater magnitudes. So it's, this is going to be a, a spirit-filled people of God movement. That's what, that's what we're being promised here in this passage. And so here's, here's where we go a little, bit, a little bit deeper, is we're going to look at the works that Jesus did and then the greater works. And so um, if you're taking notes or if you have an outline, whatever, I'm going to give you a few uh, scriptures here that define the works that Jesus was doing, okay? And so uh, here we go. Uh, during his particular ministry, um, and we'll just go through the next few, um, yeah, so the works that I do. In Luke, and we're going we're gonna to, take it through all the gospels. So you'll see four references, each from a different gospel writer. So each from a different um, perspective. For the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself, came to seek and save the lost. Okay, this is in the context of Jesus, and he's hanging out with um, this guy Zacchaeus, and nobody really likes Zacchaeus. He's kind of an outcast, and nobody, nobody would want to say the kingdom of God belongs to guys like Zacchaeus, besides Jesus, who always loves the wrong people and is famous for doing so. And so Jesus is like, man, here's, here's what I'm doing. I'm doing the Son of Man. That's me. I came this time around. Now, Jesus is coming again, right? And when he comes again, it's going to be the, the renewal of all things. But this trip, this first advent, I came to seek and save the lost. That's my mission. That's what I'm doing. I came to bring this good news that anyone can come through faith and belief and repentance. Anyone can come. I came to seek and save those who are far from God. That's what I'm doing in Luke 19. How about the next one? What were the works that Jesus is doing? In Mark 2, 17, anybody do the, start the reading plan with us? Just quick, awesome, great, great, awesome, cool. We're doing a reading plan as a church. If you missed the first week, no, no problem. Pick up with us on the next week. We're going to read through the New Testament this year, and we've got a Bible study Sunday mornings um, here at 8.50. It's an hour right before church where we kind of wor work through what we've been reading together as a church. And so this is one of the things that we read this week in Mark 2, and this is what Jesus says. And again, he says it to people who came up to him and were like, yo, why are you hanging out with all the wrong people? Well, they actually, I think, said it to his disciples. And Jesus answers, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. If you want to know what Jesus is doing, yes, he's healing. Yes, he's teaching. Yes, he's preaching. Yes, he's feeding people. He's raising the dead. He's doing a lot of cool things. But essentially, the main thing that he's doing is breaking in the kingdom of God and inviting people like you and me into it. He's seeing the sick be made well. He's seeing the lost get saved. That's what Jesus is doing throughout every activity of his earthly ministry. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What's the work that he's doing? He's inviting people into the kingdom of God. He's seeing people get saved. What else? Well, that's what Mark tells us. What about Matthew? Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so Jesus is kind of always having to define things for his disciples and, and he's teaching, like, why did I come? What does my leadership look like? What does it mean for me to be the king of kings? He's like, this is, this is why I came. This is what I'm doing. I came so that I would give my life as a ransom. A ransom means you buy somebody back out of oppression and set them free. So Jesus says that I came to die on a cross, be resurrected, ascended, send my spirit that would then bring people like me, people like you all, bring anyone who would come out of the oppression of sin and into the freedom of life with God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you don't have trouble. It doesn't mean that you don't have things that grieve you. It just means that you have the freedom of Christ to walk through it now and a promise that everything gets turned upside down when Jesus comes back. Everything gets made right. That's, why, that's what Jesus was coming to do. He was coming to free people from their slavery. Final one here um, comes from John 3.17. Now, you might be familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Okay, you know that one. If you watch NFL football throughout the years, you kind of get that one on extra points or whatever. But there's a 17 that goes with it. I love this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You know he could have. You know Jesus' first advent could have been a condemnation trip where he's like, y'all, y'all gonna burn. <laughs> like, it's gonna be bad for you. And he could have just like, like shot, like boom, boom, boom. Look at that adulteress. Look at that thief. Look at that tax collector. And he could have, he could have just brought out the hammer and crushed us. 
Now, you can't understand the good news of Jesus until you understand that's actually what you deserve. Jesus is clear that anyone outside of him will be under the condemnation of the Father for eternity. He does tell us that, but his first trip wasn't just to tell us that. It was to let us know that we're in bad shape, that we are sick, that we need a physician, and that he's it. And you, right where you are, right, right how you are, you can come. And so that's what he says. I didn't come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, so if we look at all those acts as far as like, th this is what Jesus uh, was doing, we can pretty much make a conclusion that th he, he came to um, share and invite people into the love and, and grace of God. And the final one that we have here is from Revelation 21.5, where he says, behold, I am making all things new. So Jesus is going to do that in fulfillment when he comes back, but he's actually started to do that with people like us. It, it, he started to do that through things like City House and Foster Parent Night Out and adoptions. And when you start to see wrongs in this world be made right in the name of Jesus, you know that he's making good on that promise, even right now. He's making all things new, even right now, and it's pointing to a day when he will do that in in entirety. So the works that Jesus does is very evangelical in nature. It's very evangelical where he is inviting people into the kingdom. What about these greater works? What's this idea on greater works? If you look at the book of Acts, um, I think that's telling as far as greater works go. Because in Acts, early in Acts, there's this thing that we call Pen Pentecost. And it's, um, ooh, somebody's all about Pentecost. That's awesome. You, listen, if, the, if you love the Holy Spirit, you're going to be a big fan of Pentecost, right? Because that's when the Holy Spirit comes down. And the, and, and the way that God gives the Holy Spirit now is actually changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, people would have the Holy Spirit for like a particular cause or event sometimes. But then the, then the Spirit might, might be removed from them. We see this in, in King Saul. Uh, in, in the New Testament, we can't mess it up. In the, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, and you are guaranteed the Holy Spirit, again, based on the resurrection and work of Jesus Christ. You can rest in that promise. Okay, and so God is doing this, this really cool work here that we see. And, and when we talk about greater things, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit um, is, is given, and it, and it comes down, and it, there's, there's all these um, really cool events that happen. But one of the, the main events that happen is that, like, 3,000 people get— um, so this is a churchy term. I don't, I, don't, I don't like using too many churchy terms, but they, they come to believe in Jesus— is that fair? They come to those of you who are churchy. I could say it, but a couple of other churchy words. They, they come to rest in the work of Jesus, and they begin to actually have results that look like Jesus. They, they um, you know, they, they put their faith in the person and the work of Jesus. 3,000 people are added to the number of Jesus followers, not just Jesus thinkers, but Jesus followers that day. Um, the commentary I was reading says that is a, a higher number recorded in one day of conversions than in all three years of Jesus' ministry. So watch this now. When, you, when, you, when you're going to talk about greater things, it's not like I'm looking for Kyle to raise more dead people than Jesus. It's, it's not like, you know, I'm looking over here for, um, you know, who's over here? Let's see. Dave. What's up, Dave? It's not like I'm looking for Dave to feed 5,001 people. Like, I, I'm not looking to just go one, to like one up Jesus. What we're seeing here in the book of Acts and then in the whole New Testament is this amazing spirit-filled gospel proclamation and then response. People start getting saved like crazy. People start getting called to the person and work of Jesus, just like many of you in this room have been. And that goes on in greater multitude, in greater magnitude, that's the greater thing, that we get to be a part of seeing the gospel advance even further than it did in Jesus' three years when he was physically here with his 12. You know, are you with me on that? Okay, so that's, the, and we see that in Acts, we see that in the New Testament, and so um, here's the deal. So we just want to be a part of that. Like, if that's legit, if that's truly happening, Man, we just want to hop on with all of our lives. If that's what God is doing, Jesus says, you're going to do my works, which is evangelism, which is seeking and saving the lost, and you're going to do it greater than I did, which is in like, you're, it's going to be a greater, like, multitude. There's going to be greater result and fruit. Man, why, why would you want to do anything else? 
Why would you not want to give the fullness of your life and your children and all that you love to what God is doing right now? I mentioned um, Church United before, and Church United has this vision. They call it Vision 2023, where in the next five years, they're dreaming that the number of Christ followers in our area would double from 3%, which is what it is right now, to 6%. There's 3% of people right now who are, they did a survey, Barner was involved, they had metrics, things like that. 3% of people in the South Florida area are, are Jesus followers, if you will. Believe in Jesus like we described, rest and results. And their, their dream, and they believe it's God's dream, is to see that doubled. And if, and if Jesus is telling the truth here about greater things, I think that's very much biblically in line with what Jesus wants us to do. See, see this work of his go out in greater, not better, but more vast magnitude. And so, like, I, I've, I've seen a couple of things in my sort of church life, but, but one of the things I know that God has his hand on and has anointed is the Church United Movement. And so we are a part of that. And, and what we want to do is that we want to do our job. We want to do our part in that particular vision in the South Florida area and see our area double in, in Christ followers. We want to see... 3% go to 6% in the Del Rey sort of being the centric and then you can kind of, you kind of like fan out into Boca a little bit, fan out into Boynton. I know we got people from kind of all over this, this sort of central area. And, and so for us, what that would mean, we just did some like basic metrics. Um, there, there's probably about 2,000 Christ followers right now and in, in given those type of figures in, in our area, give or take. And that, that within five years would need to go to 4,000. Okay, and we, we need to see a doubling with that. And so what we're doing is we're just paring that down, saying, what's our job? What is our responsibility? And that's where Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things, comes into play. Where, where the, the main thrust of Vision 2020, Expect Greater Things, is that we are believing that God is going to bring historic evangelical fruit in our time. Actually, we're believing for it in the next two years. Yeah. We're, we're believing that we're going to see even something like... I'm. <laughs> So if you know me, you know I, I'm like not a, like a big numbers type guy. I always get like a little like, uh, am I allowed to say that? So, so I'm going to say it because I believe God's put it on my heart, our heart. The elders have confirmed it. But, but we're, we're, we're actually believing. We saw 37 baptisms this year. We're actually believing that over the next two years we're going to see 200 baptisms. We're believing for that. Uh, we're going to work toward that. We're going to gear our lives toward that. Because as we've kind of broken down doing our part— I, I believe that we're one of the, the churches in this area that needs to lead the way in this. We, it's got to be a church united dream and, and effort, but, but we, we need to step out. You know, you know movements have, have people who step out first, early adopters and pioneers, and it doesn't always go well for the early adopters and pioneers, but God uses them to bring, like, really beautiful historic things to bring beautiful things to life. And, and we're believing that, that God wants to do that through us. And so Vision 2020, expect greater things. Um, we're actually going to expect greater things. We know what's gone before us and we're really thankful for it. We're just expecting to be a part of this greater work that God wants to do in and among us. Now, this isn't just kind of like a pie in the sky dreams, like Casey's got a cool new bumper sticker and we'll all get the bracelet and call it a day. That's not what I'm, is that, there's actually a whole culture that, that we're sensing that God's bringing in, that we need, that will support this vision. We're going to talk about that next week. It's actually four cultures that come together to support this vision, which we'll, which we'll look at next week. But here's what I want to leave you with. When, when, when it comes to expecting greater things, um, this, is, this has got to be like the year in 2019 and then even in 2020 where you expect more from Jesus and um, this church and yourself. So here, here's the application. Jesus says two words that are really important, and then we're going to be out, and we'll do Connect Day. He says, believe and because. If, could we get the passage up again, please? Can you go to that John 14, our main passage? So here's the two words that you need to kind of highlight right now as we leave. Believe and because. So this is, this is not a promise to, to anyone who, who doesn't believe. This promise is conditional to those who are resting in the finished work of Christ and, and believe in Jesus to the point where they're now following, they're campaigning, they're, they're, they're behind their leader. 
It's also a promise that's based not on our own effort or, or not on our own performance or not on your past evangelical fruit. It's an effort that's based specifically because Jesus has gone to the Father and is now sending his Holy Spirit. This is going to be a spirit-filled, saturated-led movement that we simply get to join in on, okay? And so I was thinking about, uh, is it okay to start to expect these things? Is it okay to start to expect more of Jesus? I mean, I think it is. I think that Jesus went to the cross, died, and was resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and sent us the Holy Spirit, not just so that I would be a better husband. I mean, it's cool that I love my wife like Christ loves the church, and I try to get better at that. And I don't think that Jesus died just for my anxiousness to get better. And I don't think that Jesus died just to relieve us from addiction and depression. Those things are true. They're true. I just, I think there's more, man. I think there's more than me just getting better at reading my Bible and feeling good about myself. And here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. We're gonna go on mission, and it's gonna cost you something. The first thing that needs to change is your expectation. Some of you may know this. Remember how I said you don't know me? Listen, you, you might know me. There was hours of my life that were spent on the tennis court. Hours. It actually is a big part of who I am today. All the, we just like pointed our life in this direction. And, and one of the things that has stuck with me, my, my sort of whole, I, for years and years and years was this, this deal was, I'm, look at me, look, look, go ahead, look at me. I'm not the kind of guy, if you know anything about tennis, that wins points based on power, okay? I'm the kind of guy that had a tennis career and did things with his tennis because he was able to run one more ball down than his opponent. And I had a coach at some point tell me, listen, 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 you're fast and that's cool and things like that, but I, I don't know the words he used, but he, he basically said this, you need to expect that you're gonna to get to every ball on the court. No matter where it is, no matter how short, no matter how deep, no matter how hard it is, he's like, just expect that you're gonna be able to get to every single ball on this court and you be surprised when you don't get there. I gotta tell you, I, like, I feel like I became this different player once I started to expect that whatever you give me, I'm gonna get and I would be surprised if there was actually a shot that you hit that I couldn't get to. It happened, and I'd be like, oh man, wow, I didn't get there. But if I'm wasting time wondering if I'm gonna get there, I've lost my opportunity. If I'm doubting whether or not I'm capable or I have the potential or I have the speed or I have the energy to get there, then I've already lost the moment. And I feel like many of us live our Christian lives in this dilemma of if I'm the right guy, am I the right girl, is this the right situation? The answer is yes. The answer is expect to see historical evangelical fruit in your life, with your neighbors, at your work, in your family. Expect it. And, and check this out. If it doesn't happen, you can be surprised. It's okay. You're like, oh, they didn't get saved. Huh. All right, Lord, I know you do the saving. That's cool. I just, I just kind of expected we were gonna. Okay. I really believe it's theological, I believe it's biblical, I believe it's necessary for us to start to expect these greater works, expect more of Jesus in this area. It's okay, go ahead and lean out, go ahead and lean out on this. Expect more of us as a church and then finally expect more of yourself. You have been given the spirit of the living God. You can get there. You can share your story. You can share your brokenness. You can be open and vulnerable. You can write that letter. You can make that call. You can send that text. You can engage and invite people in an even greater things, greater work sense than the person that we've fallen deeply in love with. You can do it because I know the Spirit lives with you. Jesus, as we desire to make all things about you, we ask that you would indeed fill us with your spirit, that you would give us a greater degree of faith, hope, and love, that you would raise our expectations 
not only because we're believers, but because you've gone to the Father and you've given us a spirit of confidence, of hope, of great expectation. Jesus, would you do these things and more? Would you do it in our time? Would you do it through us? We ask this by the power of your spirit and in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask our Connect Day leaders to come forward, please, and we're going to um, not dismiss you yet. I just want you to see their faces, and you're going to, when they all get up here, we'll encourage them with a great sort of AC hand that says thank you for leading, and well, you're going to do it now. Okay, that's cool. As they're coming up here, you know, some of you started to clap when I started doing that, like, whole, we're going to go get it. And it's okay that your clap was like this, because we're, I, I'm with you. I, like, I'm like, am I allowed to clap? Is this okay? Can I start to believe? But as we walk further and further in this vision, you know what we got to do? We got to get better at clapping before it happens, okay? We got to get better at that expectation. So we'll, we'll do that together. And, and um, so we're ending, we're ending a bit early today to give you the opportunity to come down and explore some of the things that we have uh, in the first quarter. I'm going to come on this side since I don't have it all memorized. And um, I'll read you a couple of things. We've got Haiti's mission trip over here, Sunday morning Bible study, Avenue Church recovery ministry, vision dinner, onboarding classes, video and tech team, grief share group. Now that doesn't mean that Carolyn does it all, by the way. <laughs> she represents one of those. And, okay, over here we've got hospitality. So if, if you know... If you're feeling unloved, you want to stop here first. <laughs> Hospitality team, connection team, FPO, that's Foster Parent Night Out, Av Kids Ministry, right here. Reminder, there's an Av Kids Ministry meeting just after this. Here we've got men's ministry, women's ministry, my parents and Rick Ireland, so you got to stop at this table. And uh, relational harmony, sacred search, boundaries, youth ministry, Liz, uh, you got you to gotta stop at all these places, okay? So I'm going to end now. I'm going to pray for them, and uh, we'll get you out here just a, a few minutes early and give you the opportunity to come forward. Have kids knows that they're going to be hanging out with your kids for a little bit, so come forward, check it out, and then if you have kids, go grab the kids. Father, thank you for this group. Lord, thank you for today. We ask that you would connect our hearts to you and to what you're doing here, these greater things. Lord, we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. Come on up. <laughs>